the unforgiving glare of Upsilon Orionis beat down upon the sand-strewn airfield of Cairo Aerodrome. Aerodrome sounded an overly grandiose title for this motley collection of corrugated iron buildings, most roofed with similarly ruffled panels of some fibrous concrete material. Only the mooring towers for visiting airships shared the same design as those seen on Albia, Germania or Hungaria. These had been donated by the Albion Empire, a far from selfless act as it turned out. Although Cairo had its own independent government, it was still heavily reliant on support from the empire of which it had so recently been a part. This support came both in fiscal and military aid. Cairo may have appeared to have mastered standing on its own two feet, but only in the same way a puppet might. As it was, the docking towers hardly lent much additional glamour to the spaceport, given they were simply constructed from scaffolding, lending them a very temporary or ad hoc appearance. The A-36 airship was now attached to one of these elevated lift shafts, and many native workers could be seen hurrying to and fro, loading and unloading luggage, cargo and supplies. Among this movement of material were disembarking and embarking passengers. In spite of the fact that there were no easily discernible physical differences between the native Cairoans and the predominantly Albion passengers and aircrew, it was clear that the former were treated with some disdain by the latter, at least by a significant proportion of the Albions present. As mentioned, the Cairoans shared the same alabaster white glowing skin as the Albions. They had the same full-lipped mouths, tiny noses and ridiculously full eyes as their imperial kin. The only way an outsider, the Doctor and Romana included, could tell them apart was through their dress and their speech. The everyday clothes of the average Chiroan were eminently practical given the sweltering daytime conditions over much of their planet. They wore long flowing robes of lightweight cloth, predominantly dyed beige, tan, brown, black or occasionally bleached white. Their loose fit, including voluminous sleeves, allowed plenty of airflow around their bodies, aiding cooling while simultaneously blocking much of their star's radiation from striking their skin directly. While some on Albia, Hungaria and the rest of the outer planets wore hats of varying designs, either due to their occupations, their traditions or simply as fashion statements, on Cairo things were of a different order. Every Chiroan wore carefully wrapped turbans or headscarves which completely covered and protected their leaf-like fronds which sprouted from central ridges on their heads. This headgear was only removed once indoors and their fronds were never altered to appear more hair-like as was the prevailing fashion on the outer planets. The second notable difference in Chiroan culture from that of Albia and other planets so far visited by the Time Lords was their language, though perhaps it might be fairer to say languages. Obviously, as the planet of the discovery of the Encyclopaedia Britannica over 3,000 years ago, the entire planet spoke English. However, there was an obvious local accent which derived in part from their familiarity with their other language, that being modern Chiroan. Modern Chiroan was of equal import and significance to anyone born of that world, and had itself evolved from ancient Chiroan, the language of the earliest settlers of the entire Upsilon Orionis system. Cairo was an ancient and knowledgeable culture, worthy of the respect of all, even if some forgot this. The party from the Albion Imperial Museum stood on the dusty landing strip, watching the native workers with expressions ranging from fascination through disinterest to barely concealed disdain as the workers busied themselves with delivering the last of the luggage. The Doctor and Romana, much to the surprise of their Albion companions, had not adjusted their outfits in the slightest to match their sun-scorched new locale. Even Lou Halbert, usually never without her leather layers in public, had actually taken off her long polished coat and had it draped over one arm. Similarly, Nathan Ivon, P.I., had removed his trench coat and held it in a similar fashion. Neither the professor nor the detective had removed their headgear, doubtless because Nathan's fedora and even Lou's flying helmet offered some shade from the relentless rays of Upsilon Orionis. Indeed, their final companion, Timmy Cowley, while less encumbered than the other two, being already only in a loose white button-up shirt and linen slacks, had forgotten to wear a hat. From the way he flapped at himself with a folded handkerchief, it looked as though he was suffering for his oversight. The attention of all were caught by a droning, spluttering vehicle, obviously heading in their direction from the main airport buildings. It was a truck, and a far from new one at that. It appeared to be at least ten years old, and more than likely it had seen service in the last Great War. 
it was becoming increasingly clear that much of the technology on Cairo were cast-offs and hand-me-downs, at least when not directly owned by a company of one of the system's great powers, Albia and the like. The truck rumbled to a stop in front of them, the driver switching off the engine, which idled on for a few more uneven revolutions before finally becoming silent. The driver appeared to be the only occupant. He opened the door, clambered out of the cab, and stood before the party, waving awkwardly. He was dressed in a loose cream shirt, not dissimilar to those of most of the Albion Imperial Museum party. The rest of his outfit did depart a little from that pattern. His slacks billowed outwards from the waist to become skin-tight just above the knee. From here they disappeared into black leather riding boots just below the knees. His outfit was capped off with a beige pith helmet, giving him the impression of being some gangly exotic mushroom. He was the perfect fusion of Albion imperialism run riot combined with office-bound nerd. Hello, Professor Halbert, and party. Glad you got here safely, came his somewhat halting nasal greeting. Lou stepped forward and shook his hand. Percival Lampton, good to see a familiar face. I hope acting as in-house liaison for us at the Abydos Museum of Antiquities isn't too dull for you. As for our safe arrival, unfortunately we lost one, but the rest of us are more or less whole. Percival looked thrown and even more socially awkward, having been subjected to Lou's unvarnished assessment of their party's condition. The doctor took this pause as an opportunity to step in. Good day to you, Professor Lampton, he said questioningly. Just doctor, Percival responded with a brief shy smile. I haven't reached those lofty heights yet, not like my good colleague Lou. The doctor gave his best impression of a warm smile. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doctor. As I'm sure you've already been made aware, that is my own title and name, if you like. Oh, you're the doctor, Percival asked, eyes wide and curious. The doctor nodded. Indeed, the definite article. This is my close companion, Romana, expert in too many fields to mention right now, and presumably you already know Mr. Nathan Ivon and Mr. Timmy Cowley. Dr. Lambton waggled his head. Only by reputation, but I'm very pleased to meet you all. You can just call me Percy, by the way. Now, I suppose you'll all want to get settled in at the Abydos Imperial Hotel. We have rooms booked for you all. The doctor shook his head. No, he said firmly. We must set up camp immediately at the site of the supposed entrance to the Anubis tomb. Preferably, we should reoccupy the site left by the first expedition. Percy nodded. Of course, we can use the truck I came in, plus I have another held in reserve with the same local firm. We shall have some native bearers too, to help with the labour and also to guard the camp. I am a little concerned over that sizable object there. It could take up quite a bit of space. Percy's final remark was made with a nod towards the TARDIS. The doctor frowned. Well, I suppose it could be stored here at the aerodrome, if they have such facilities. Percy nodded vigorously. Oh yes, we have space, permanently rented in one of the warehouses over there, usually for storage of items in transit from museums or digs here to the Albion Imperial Museum itself. Storing it here should be no trouble at all. Romana frowned. The doctor, seeing this, sought to reassure her. Never fear, Romana. I'm sure K-9 will look after it. Romana shook her head. I was more thinking that the TARDIS or K-9 or both might come in handy. But I suppose here is as good a place as any for it. The doctor nodded in agreement. Now, before Romana and I join the rest of our party at the dig site, we would like to see the survivors of the first expedition, if possible. We would. Romana chipped in, puzzled. We would, the doctor confirmed firmly. And I trust Lou can lead the rest of the party to re-establish base camp. Lou nodded briskly. Of course I can. I can drive you to the hospital myself, Percy said grimly. We'll hand this truck over to one of the native chappies and I'll take my car, but I doubt you'll like what you find. The doctor nodded slowly. Like it or not, we need to know what happened. Oh, and Lou, until we've caught up with you, don't re-enter the tents left by the old museum expedition, was his final warning. Percival Lampton pulled his small and dust-covered car to a halt in front of the Abydos Asylum for the Insane, 
Doctor and Romanus squashed together on his less than spacious rear seats. They had passed through a fair chunk of the Cairoan capital to get there, an odd assortment of traditional Cairoan architecture, much of it unchanged in construction for thousands of years, and more modern grandiose buildings built in the last century or so, mostly in the Albion colonial style. The empire may have officially departed, but its presence could still be felt throughout the city and indeed the planet. The asylum itself was, surprisingly, of a more traditional Cairoan design, a low single-storey building built in the traditional Nile mud brick, covered in plaster daub and finished with a coat of whitewash paint. The windows it had were high up in the walls and barred, whilst its entrance door was of thick black-painted wood reinforced with iron straps and covered in pointed metal studs. The entire building looked more like a prison than a hospital. As Percy, the Doctor and Romana left the vehicle, the museum employee saw the two Time Lords exchanging dubious glances. Yes, I know. Cairo and medicine and resources are a little basic. I'm going to see if I can speed up Raymond's transfer back to a faculty on Albia. He explained with some embarrassment. The Doctor frowned. Just Raymond's transfer? Raymond White, logistics officer, I assume. But I understood there were several survivors of the original party. Percy shook his head sadly. Now there's only one survivor, if you can call him that. As of last night, at least, I'm afraid the other, Professor Cole, primary investigator, took his own life. Raymond attempted to as well, which is why he will be secured in the way he is when you see him. The other two expedition members who survived had seizures the first night after the incident and never recovered. We lost them then and there. Percival negotiated their entrance to the facility. They made their way down a dark and gloomy corridor, led by Percy and an orderly, a well-meaning Cairoan named Khamun, who seemed even more embarrassed by the condition of the hospital than the Albion. As well as being poorly lit, the corridor had a slightly grimy look to it. Although they could see even now another Cairoan staff member hard at work trying to clean the floors and surfaces, the unglazed tiles and bare porous brickwork was far from easy to maintain. Cries could be heard from all over the building, as those tortured by their own minds screamed for a release it seemed unlikely they would ever find, or argued ceaselessly with unseen tormentors whose half of the conversation could only be guessed at. The patients' rooms themselves were secured with heavy doors with tiny barred observation windows, adding still further to the prison-like nature of this hellish place. At last they reached a door with the name Raymond White crudely scratched on it in chalk. Although they could see the man within was seated, it was hard to get a good view through the tiny grated window. May we go in to see him? The doctor asked somberly. Hamun nodded and unlocked the door. Upon entering the cell, it could be seen why there had been no qualms about opening the entrance. Raymond White was sitting in a sturdy wooden chair in the centre of that small room. There was a rough wooden bed with a bedpan partially protruding from beneath, but Raymond had no means to reach either now. He was firmly strapped into a straitjacket, which was in turn strapped to the chair. The unfortunate Albion had a weird rictus grin upon his face, and an utterly vacant look to his bulging, staring eyes. Beneath his matted and tousled hair, a significant wound could be seen in the middle of his forehead. There was much bruising and an abundance of broken skin, skin which had barely begun to heal. Percy nodded towards this damage. He tried to smash his own head in against the wall. That was before we realised the danger and secured him as you see him now. If the orderlies hadn't found him and restrained him, I've no doubt he would have succeeded in killing himself. Professor Cole did, after all. The doctor looked grim, the sight before him echoing one he'd seen before. Romana looked at him curiously, wondering what memory was troubling him. Mr White, the doctor called softly. Can you hear me? The bound man showed no extra signs of life in his eyes, his attitude unchanged from before. He did, however, let slip the briefest of giggles. <laughs> the sound chilled the hearts of both Time Lords. While not identical in tone or context, it was alarmingly similar to the incessant giggling of the bulk-infested penguins on Antarctica that they had both seen and dealt with all too recently. It was also eerily similar to the possessed rats on Mondas, which the Doctor had encountered before that. Romana leaned towards the doctor. Doctor, do you think he may be infected? 
The doctor frowned and stroked his chin before withdrawing his sonic screwdriver. He scanned the hapless and oblivious Albion confined in his chair. After several seconds of audible probing, the doctor ceased and studied the results. Hmm, he began thoughtfully. The unfortunate logistics officer does at least seem free of active contamination by bulk creatures. However, there are signs he has been exposed to the bulk itself in the recent past. I have little doubt this is how he lost his mind. The giggling is probably just a memory of things he encountered there. Romana shook her head sadly. How horrible. What do you think he was exposed to the bulk? I'm not sure. It is worrying, though. The only direct contact we've seen so far with that 11-dimensional realm has been in space, via the rifts, those clams of death. If he's been exposed on the surface of Cairo, things may be far worse than we imagined. Seeing there was no more which could be done here, the two Time Lords and Percival Lampton left the cell with the orderly, who locked it behind them. The Doctor and Romana waited in the entrance hall of the Abydos Asylum for the Insane, a room no less grubby or gloomy than the rest of the Institute. Percy had entered the office of the hospital administrator to finalise, he hoped, arrangements to move Raymond White to more modern care and accommodation on Albia. Something had clearly been troubling Romana. Now they were alone, she felt free to voice her concerns. Doctor, I know there are bigger fish to fry, but shouldn't we be doing more to fix things here? The doctor frowned and looked a little puzzled. By bigger fish, I assume you mean preventing the complete collapse and destruction of this star system, or possibly the entire universe, if some higher order bulk entity is invited into it. But what more would you like? Romana shook her head a little impatiently. Yes, yes, that was the fish I was referring to. What I meant was the inequities in this system's wider society. One planet preying upon another, the empire building, the worst, the subjugation, no matter how subtly affected, of whole planets such as Cairo here. Shouldn't we do something about that? The doctor gave a smile born of a million memories and countless secrets. The universe has mysterious ways its wonders to perform, he began. It seems to me that that is not the way we are expected to behave. Even in traditional Time Lord society, effecting great changes in the course of history was somewhat taboo. And even in my own personal history, it would appear the universe has peculiar plans for my talents. Romana frowned. You're talking almost as if the universe is sentient. You're not descending into theism now, are you? The doctor chuckled, spreading his hands wide. (laughs) <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Perish the thought. But you cannot deny that you and I, and all sentient beings in the universe, are thinking and communicating. Almost as if we are the brain cells of the universe. Perhaps there is a measure of sentience in the interconnectedness of all things. Who can say? Romana thought about this, mulling over the ideas and their implications. The doctor used this pause to continue. As I said... The universe seems to place me, or indeed us, in situations of extremes of scale. Yes, we have saved the entire universe on more than one occasion. At other times, we may simply be rescuing little Jimmy who's fallen down a well. But rarely, if ever, do we affect large-scale re-engineering of societies, at least not obviously. Do you know I once met the Emperor Nero? Famously mad, burnt Rome to the ground and caused the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands presided over one of the cruelest and most unequal empires in history, bread and circuses and all that. Do you know what I did? Romana shook her head. I did not. What did you do? The doctor gave a wry smile. I pretended to play the liar for him. Romana looked aghast. And what exactly did that achieve? The doctor shrugged. Well, it put him off killing me and my companions for a while, I expect. But in itself, maybe nothing at all. But it's possible, through the kindness shown to others while there, they may have changed their minds as to how their society should run, or strengthened their pre-existing convictions in that regard. Never be cruel, never be cowardly. Laugh hard, run fast, be kind. Romana smiled indulgently at the doctor. Wise words indeed. 
But do you see anyone we have met on Albia or elsewhere in the system showing much promise? The doctor waggled his head non-committally. Well, Lou Halbert may have her rough edges. Plenty of rough edges. But she has shown some awareness of the state of things, and I doubt she is alone. And Nathan Ivon, he's shown a surprising openness to the wider context of things, this system's place in the cosmos and beyond. Then he shrugged and shook his head. But we rarely get to stay and see the long game play out. We can but hope that things turn out better in the end. Percival Lampton drove the two Time Lords to the Abydos Museum of Antiquities to pick up the second truck. This vehicle looked as well used as the one Lou, Nathan and Timmy had taken from the aerodrome, along with three native workers. Percy told them he would be tied up with museum business, including the safe transport of poor Raymond White, and so would be unable to accompany them to the dig site. He assured them, however, that the three more native bearers who would travel with them knew the way, and one would act as their driver. The Doctor and Romana bade farewell to Dr Lampton, and they were off. They sat up front next to the driver, while the other two hired hands rode in the back of the truck with the extra equipment stored there. Their journey took them through central Abydos until they reached the River Nile. There the truck joined a road which ran along its eastern bank. In spite of the difference in spelling, it was clear the river's name had arisen due to its similarity with its earthly namesake, or vice versa, or both had been named through bulk influences which could only be guessed at. Soon the buildings thinned and the road became little more than a track through the sand, still following the course of the majestic river. They could see the odd boat moving up or downstream, plying their trades, either goods, passengers or fishing. While some were motorised, most were shallow draft sailing vessels with triangular sails. In the late afternoon sun, it all looked quite idyllic. They did not have to pass far from the edge of the city before their quarry came into view. The pyramids were closest, and they practically passed underneath them while the suburbs were still in sight. Once beyond them, they could see the Anubis monument properly. It was set a little further back from the river, as the watercourse made a gentle sweeping turn to avoid it. Then, at last, they saw the Albion Imperial Museum camp. It appeared to be on a shallow rise from river and road, the tent sitting perhaps halfway between the track and the peak of this gentle hill. On that peak there were signs of ancient ruined masonry, along with a few spotlights and other equipment which must have been set up there far more recently. The Anubis Monument itself was at least twice the distance from the Nile to the hilltop beyond that same peak. Their truck turned off the road and headed up the hill straight for the expedition camp, struggling through the shifting sand. The Time Lords could see the other truck at the nearest end of the campsite, Lou, Nathan and Timmy on or around it, as well as the three Chiroans assigned to them. Clearly, they had heeded the Doctor's warning not to enter the tents. The driver pulled their truck up alongside the other vehicle, and everyone disembarked. About bloody time, Timmy snapped tetchily. I can't see why you made us stay out here in this damned heat when we have perfectly usable tents available. I mean, the local authorities and the Albion Army consultants examined the tents inside and out after whatever happened to the others happened, and they suffered no ill effects. What are we waiting for? The doctor's expression was far from impressed, but he made his best effort to accommodate the recent widower. You may be perfectly correct, but if you had seen the state of poor Raymond White, now the previous expedition's sole survivor, you might be less keen to rush in where angels fear to tread. I would recommend you let me examine them at least before we pile on in. Timmy looked far from mollified, but offered no further objections. The doctor wandered over to the nearest tent, and Romana went with him. This may simply have been for moral support or a show of solidarity in the face of Timmy's grumblings. However, from the way she hefted her sword stick, she may have had more concrete protection in mind. The first tent was thoroughly scanned, initially outside, then within, both Time Lords fearlessly crossing the first threshold. They then repeated this process with the other two accommodation tents before finishing off with the supply tent. The Doctor and Romana walked back to the others, the Doctor still studying his sonic screwdriver intently as they arrived. Well, Timmy said impatiently, is it safe? The doctor frowned. That depends on your idea of security, and after all, you are the expert in that, he replied with a raise of his eyebrows. Before Timmy could respond, the doctor ploughed on. However, I can tell you what my scans uncovered. 
Here the doctor paused to ensure he had the attention of all. There was evidence of tampering with the fabric of space-time in each of the accommodation tents. The supply tent had been untouched, literally, it seems. What we detected were almost like micro-fractures in our universe, focused upon each of the living quarters. At the most intense points of disturbance, they looked like handprints. The letters. Lou cried. Dr. Nugati wandered around the camp on his last day, laying on hands. The doctor nodded grimly. I doubt they are unconnected. Speaking of connected, there were faint hints of fractures extending from each tent towards the peak of the hill, almost as if they had somehow connected them to the bulk via some remote power source. Here. Let me show you. With that, the doctor made an adjustment to his sonic screwdriver, then held it aloft. He then issued a continuous signal from it. Instantly, faint glowing green traces could be seen, in spite of the late afternoon sunlight. On the tents themselves, they looked almost like fractures of damaged car windscreens. Only at the centre of each radiating spray of cracks was the ominous green silhouette of a hand. From these handprints arced strange fragmentary trails, looking almost like thin lightning bolts captured by some fast exposure photography. These lines were now incomplete, as time must have begun to erase them. Nevertheless, it was clear all the partial trails led from the tents to join at the jumbled masonry on the peak of the hill. Tell me, the doctor continued, is the suspected Anubis tomb entrance up there by any chance? As the doctor said this, he lowered his hand and switched off the screwdriver, while nodding towards the ancient remains and floodlights overlooking the camp. Lou nodded her confirmation. The doctor's head dipped knowingly. Then it is as I suspected. Somehow he is already drawing upon a connection to the bulk in the Anubis tomb, even if he has not yet physically gained access to that place. We must move quickly to stop him before he does. In spite of the gravity of the doctor's words, Timmy was not ready to release all command to this bizarre alien. First, we need to unload the trucks, he demanded imperiously. And we need to store anything we're not carrying into the tomb in our newly sanctified accommodation, he continued. And finally, we need to decide what we do actually need to take with us. In spite of the doctor's impatience to enter the excavations immediately, he could sense some sympathy in the others towards Timmy's points. Reluctantly, he was forced to concede that the security expert might have some valid views after all. Timmy started ordering the Cairo and helpers around as if born to the task. The doctor and Romana made their way towards an unclaimed tent to wait out the conclusion of this busy work. The last thing they noticed before entering their tent was a large and cumbersome portable telecom unit being manhandled into the supply tent. Some arms had clearly been twisted such that the Cairo military had happily supplied it, although it was probably fair to say the Albion military had commandeered it. They entered the tent just as the sun touched the horizon. Evening was upon them. The two Time Lords realised they did not really have anything to store, and after switching on a couple of lamps and spending a few seconds deciding whose camp bed was whose, had very little to do. This was probably why the Doctor was so easily distracted by a conversation from outside. Timmy was shouting at a couple of the native workers to gather driftwood from down by the river in order to build a fire. The Doctor reopened the tent flap and shouted out to him, Why on Cairo do you want a fire? All you've done all day is complain about the heat. Timmy frowned at the Doctor in annoyance. Because the temperature drops like a stone on Cairo once the sun is down. It's a desert thing. Looking at how you two are dressed, I can see the heat doesn't bother you, and perhaps the cold doesn't either. But some of us prefer not to freeze overnight. The doctor inclined his head, conceding his point, then retreated into the tent once more. The Doctor and Romana had been sitting on one of the beds studying some of the photographs and documents Sir Arthur Buchan, curator in charge of expeditions at the Albion Imperial Museum, had given them. These were chiefly regarding the Anubis tomb, the sarcophagi they had previously encountered, and numerous other facets of ancient Cairo and civilization. Their largely silent contemplation and reflection was disrupted by a blood-curdling scream. This was immediately followed by confused shouting and terrified yells. 
The Doctor and Romana haired out of the tent, only to skid to a halt in front of it, paralysed for a moment by the horror before them. About eight yards in front of their tent, indeed roughly at the centre of all the canvas shelters, was a roaring fire of quite lengthy driftwood logs piled very carefully in a conical arrangement. Timmy stood about five yards from the blaze, whose construction was clearly of his exacting design. Yet he was not admiring his handiwork. Nor were Lou or Nathan, who stood with him. All were staring down the slope towards the River Nile. Between the nearest bank and the park trucks was a scene of such confusion and impossibility that it boggled the minds of all who saw it. Marching up the hill from the water's edge were three huge creatures of terrifying aspect. Each must have been twelve feet long from the tips of their outstretched claws to their stubby fan-like tails. They were raised five feet off the ground by eight jointed legs, thinner matches to the more muscular arms they held before them or aloft. Their entire bodies, appendages included, were covered in thick armour. The head creature held one of the native bearers in one claw, gripping him across his abdomen, the other hired help fleeing before it up the hill. The unfortunate captured Chiroan screamed once more before dropping to the floor. He had been severed in two by the beast's pincer. Lobsters! Romana cried in horror and disbelief. The doctor nodded grimly. So it would appear. I had no idea they grew to such size on Cairo, or were so comfortable on land. Lou turned to face the doctor, horrified but still in possession of her wits. They don't. And aren't. She clarified desperately. The three giant amphibious lobsters continued to close on the Time Lords and their companions, clacking their claws menacingly with every step. 